All right, so tonight's program is Dr. Robert Bosnecker. I hope I pronounced that great. And um, he's an adjunct lecturer in the Department of Geology and Environmental Geosciences at the College of Charleston. And Laura is going to introduce him. Okay, I'm just sending an email to someone with the link. Here we are. Okay, um, Dr. Dr. Robert Bosenecker grew up in Northern California, obsessed with dinosaurs and fossils from a very young age, and started collecting fossils as a high school student. He studied relatively young fossil marine mammals from just before the Ice Age as an undergraduate, and the preservation of marine vertebrate fossils as a master's student at Montana State University. He studied early baleen whales from New Zealand for his PhD research at the University of Otago in New Zealand. And in 2015, he graduated and began working at the College of Charleston and the Mace Brown Museum of Natural History, teaching geology and paleontology and continuing the study of early whales. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bosenecker. Thanks y'all, let me, uh go ahead and share my screen here. All right, so um, this talk is going to be uh, mostly on local fossils and a quick disclaimer, there are no dinosaurs in this talk with a little asterisk. There are no dinosaur fossils in uh, this part of South Carolina, though you can find some in Myrtle Beach. Um, I'll get a little bit uh, more in detail about why that is here in a minute. Okay, so uh, at the College of Charleston, we have the Mace Brown Museum of Natural History. Um, hold on, this bar is covering up part of the, my, my screen. All right, well, whatever. Um, we're a small university museum in downtown Charleston. Uh, if you haven't been before, um, well, obviously we're closed right now, uh, but when we reopen, the museum is free. We're open every day of the week, but Wednesdays, and we are part of the Department of Geology and Environmental Geosciences at CFC. We have a reasonably large collection for a museum of our small size. Um, as of a couple of years ago, when I first wrote this slide, we have 30,000 specimens. That's likely much more than that, at, probably at least 50,000 by now. About 5% of our collection is on display. Most of our fossils are from South Carolina. A lot are from North Carolina as well. And our museum boasts many, many fossils collected and donated by amateur paleontologists. Most importantly, we have a world-class collection of oligocene whales and dolphins, which highlight the transition between four-legged whales, like this uh, skeleton we see on the lower left, um, to modern whales, uh, which have no legs, um, but uh, evolve the ability to filter feed using baleen and echolocation, which are a couple topics I'll be diving into a little bit. Before I progress, um, uh, we need to talk about a little bit of basic geology first. So there's going to be some, some jargon that's unescapable. And first is uh, the geologic time scale. These are all the different periods. Unlike my students at CFC, you don't have to memorize any of this. There's no quiz afterwards. But um, the Earth is about roughly four and a half billion years old. And I've got a bunch of feature or, um, events here uh, relevant to South Carolina. So Pangaea forms um, during the uh, Carboniferous, which is the Mississippian and Pennsylvania periods, roughly about 360 to 300 million years ago it forms. Um, and when that happens, a gigantic mountain range uh, gets uplifted. That is, the Appalachians are the remnants of this major mountain range sort of like the Himalaya caused by India colliding with Asia. Pangaea splits apart at the beginning of the Jurassic period, so during the time of dinosaurs. 
Um, and it is during this time that we start getting marine rocks deposited on the Atlantic coastal plain. In South Carolina, however, uh, we don't get any marine rocks on this new continental margin the, uh, until the late Cretaceous. And those are rocks that you can go and explore in southeastern North Carolina and the Myrtle Beach area called the PD Formation. About 65 million years ago, we have the extinction of dinosaurs, marine reptiles, and other groups um, leading to the age of mammals, which is the Cenozoic. And we get the first uh, marine deposits of the Cenozoic within the Charleston Embayment in the Eocene Epoch. The Eocene is when whales evolved from land animals to sea animals. Most of our fossils we'll be talking about today are from the Oligocene Epoch. So by this time, whales have become fully marine and diverge into the echolocating whales and the baleen whales. In South Carolina, during the Miocene Epoch, some 23 to 5 million years ago, there's widespread erosion. We have very few Miocene deposits um, uh, in South Carolina. And then we get the earliest modern species and genera of marine mammals during the Pliocene. And by the Pleistocene, sea level falls, and we have mostly terrestrial deposits uh, where we find things like giant ground sloths, mammoths, mastodons, horses, bison, so on and so forth. And then humans crossed the Bering Land Bridge about 12 to 16,000 years ago, and the rest is technically uh, human prehistory and far too young for me to care about. More uh, background. So you're going to hear me using some of these terms, or you'll see them on the screen. A formation is a mappable rock layer. Generally not like a single thin layer um, that's like a few inches thick, but formations are usually at least a few feet thick to a few miles thick. Um, in, the, in South Carolina, most formations are at least a meter or two thick and sometimes up to 100 meters. And they are given a name. So they are a rock unit that you can map at the Earth's surface. So they have a sort of um, con confined geographic area and then they are some certain thickness and the age can range depending upon what part of the formation you're in. Uh, so I'll be talking a lot about the Ashley Formation, named in West Ashley. MYO, you'll see that um, commonly in this talk that's an abbreviation for a million years ago. Epoch, these are the subdivisions of the Cenozoic era. You'll be hearing me talk about the Oligocene extensively. Um, you may hear the terms transgression and regression. These are meaning sea level rise or sea level fall, and they leave different types of deposits. Transgressions tend to have an erosional uh, unit at the bottom with lots and lots of fossils. Regressions tend to result in widespread erosion and gaps in time. Uh, and then you might hear me talk about a bone bed. A bone bed is a condensed deposit with lots of bones, fossil teeth, and phosphate formed by erosion and non-deposition. Okay, so um, a little bit more recent history. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the famous naturalist from the 19th century, Louis Agassiz. Um, Agassiz did a lot. Uh, he was one of the first glacial geomorphologists, uh, but he also worked a lot on fossils. These are all megalodon teeth, giant shark megalodon, um, that Agassiz published in the 1840s. And most of these were collected in South Carolina. So fossils have been known about in South Carolina for quite a long time. Later on, folks like Joseph Leidy, who was the first person to publish a, um, dinosaurs from North America, and also technically was the first person to publish fossils of Tyrannosaurus rex, though he didn't know they were T-Rex fossils at the time, and they wouldn't be officially named T-Rex until uh, about 40 years later. Um, Leidy was the, the first real vertebrate paleontologist in North America. These are all fossils found during excavation of the 
uh, Ashley phosphate beds right here in Charleston. So um, many of these things are beaked whale skulls. They're quite strange. Uh, these are these big triangular things. Others, there's a walrus tusk on the left image in the center. Um, that curved thing, that's a walrus tusk. The teeth below it are sperm whale teeth, gigantic uh, predatory killer sperm whales. On the right-hand side, we have a couple more beaked whale skulls and all sorts of tooth plates from extinct eagle rays and cow nose rays. So most of these are under 15 million years old, and they're all from the bottom of the Ashley River, Cooper River, and the Wando River found during phosphate dredging. Phosphate mining started shortly after the Civil War. Uh, there are widespread phosphate deposits, and, and I'll talk about the phosphate industry for in a minute, but phosphate tends to uh, occur as these little, what we call concretions or nodules. They form just below the seafloor during periods of time when you have a combination of erosion and high primary productivity caused by upwelling. So they're they tend to be fairly restricted in time and space, but uh, places like Charleston, the uh, Salisbury Embayment in eastern North Carolina, um, and then northern, north central Florida, uh, around between Gainesville and Tampa, um, those three areas are some of the richest phosphate deposits in the U.S. And in all three uh, places, you had relatively um, slow sedimentation. So sand and gravel are not being deposited very, very quickly, which leaves the seafloor kind of stable for a long time. Um, when that happens and you have upwelling, there's all sorts of mass die off that happens. And that ends up um, freeing a lot of uh, phosphorus. And if you have a slightly lower than neutral pH, that can also dissolve away a lot of shells, help deposit phosphate, and you end up with deposits um, widespread in Charleston and beyond that have very few marine invertebrates. So all of your corals, bivalves, um, snails, uh, bryozoans, etc., they all dissolve. But marine vertebrate fossils tend to be overrepresented um, and concentrated during periods of phosphogenesis. Phosphate nodules themselves, if you treat them, clean them off, and then dissolve the phosphorus and acid, it becomes uh, extremely rich agricultural fertilizer. So Civil War ends. Um, within about three or four years, the first curator of the College of Charleston Museum um, is fired, Francis Holmes, uh, who was a, formerly a planter um, up in Ladson. Um, and I'll talk more about Holmes in a minute, but Holmes had accrued this large fossil collection uh, even before phosphate mining began. And he started the first mining company here in Charleston selling phosphate. And many other companies um, started shortly after. And a few interesting things of note. One, it was a very important industry for, uh, to basically get recently freed slaves back to work. Although it didn't pay well, it was very hazardous. And many contemporary historians say the difference between it and actual slavery is a bit subtle, um, more of a technicality. I, I wouldn't want to be slinging phosphate in the summer in Charleston with 100% humidity and 105 degrees. Um, all of these, uh, you can see up on the upper left, um, the majority of the workers were African American, recently freed slaves. All of these strip mines were either dug by hand or by using plows and oxen. If you go out to Drayton Hall, um, a very large part of the estate was strip mined for phosphate mining 
Same with Runnymede Plantation, um, as well as Middleton Place. Uh, and if you drive along, um, not 17, 61, uh, west of Magnolia, Magnolia Plantation as well, you'll see all these big ridges that are about maybe a couple hundred feet long and about 15 feet high. Those are piles of dirt left over from phosphate mining that are still there 140 years later. By the 1880s, they had shifted completely from land phosphate to river phosphate, and they started dredging the rivers pretty soon. Um, Holmes's company was entirely based on river phosphate, if memory serves. So river phosphate kind of won out. It was easier to do. You just needed a barge and a bucket, a uh, bucket loader. Um, and there are still remains of some phosphate mills. Um, or whatever you call the processing facilities uh, along the mar along the shores of the Cooper River and I think I think the Ashley River as well. Anyway, some of the fossils that were discovered during phosphate mining were large megalodon teeth, um, all sorts of smaller shark teeth, whale bones, uh, ice age mammals like big old mammoth teeth. Um, what we've got on the lower right, uh, this is a photo I took a couple weeks ago. This is from a phosphate deposit up here in North Charleston. This is material that I washed, ironically, actually using some of the same methods um, as these miners in the 1860s, 1870s, I should say. I mean, the thing about dirt and rocks and fossils is there's not a whole lot in the way of technology other than shovels, screens, a little bit of water, um, and a lot of elbow grease to get the fossils out of the ground and cleaned. So methods haven't really changed much. Um, and dinosaur paleontology, by the way, started at about the same time in the uh, uh, American West. And the methods used out there are more or less identical to what they were in the 1870s. Here's a geologic map of Charleston, and all of that sort of, I guess it's a salmon color, those are all phosphate spoils. Those are all areas where that entire area has been churned up um, and redeposited entirely by strip mining. All of that area was strip mined, which means if you go and dig there right now, you won't find any fossils, nor will you find any phosphate because it was completely removed. It'll just be churned up, mixed up, topsoil. So if you want to find fossils, you're going to have to dig in anywhere between those um, salmon areas. And then if you go too far west, north, south, or east, the uh, good rocks that have lots of fossils will be too deep. So um, some of the early fossil discoveries from Charleston uh, are right here. On the lower right is Agarophius pygmaeus, which is a primitive dolphin. And Agarophius was discovered in 1847 at Middleton Place. Somewhere, we're not sure exactly where on the property. Um, a locality called Greer's Landing, but nobody knows where. <laughs> on the upper right is Dio uh, Dioplotherium manigoi, named after uh, one of the manigos. I forget which one. Um, I think the, maybe Gabriel Manigo. Whoever, whichever, whichever Manigo was the, uh, in charge of Charleston Museum in the 1870s. This was named by Edward Drinker Cope, who of course was the same paleontologist who named um, many dinosaurs from the um, American West during a period of time in paleontology called the Bone Wars. And then on the left is Xenorophis slonii, which was collected from a marl pit in Ladson. Um, pretty much just about a mile south of the Highway 78 Ladson Road intersection. Not too far off from my house. This was collected in about 1900, right on the, so after phosphate mining was over, they were still using some of the pits for mining marl. All three of these fossils were collected from the Ashley Formation, which is about 28 to 30 million years old. Not much happened in Charleston 
for another 40, 60 years or so. So that fossil, Xenorophis, that was named by the director of the Smithsonian, Remington Kellogg, in the uh, 1920s. Um, and they'd had the fossil for about 15 years at that point. Nobody was really digging up anything in Charleston until the 1960s, when subdivisions were starting to be built. Al Sanders, who's the uh, gentleman on the right-hand side in the upper right corner, Al Sanders, the former natural history curator at Charleston Museum, just passed away this last winter. Um, and he amassed an incredible collection over at Charleston Museum, including uh, this gigantic dolphin, genus Y, which is still unnamed. Um, Sanders, unfortunately, never got to publish it. Uh, but he did get to have named Gavialisuchus carolinensis, which is this giant uh, marine uh, crocodile um, from the slightly younger Chandler Bridge Formation, which is about 25 million years ago, or years old. Both of these fossils are from the Somerville area. In the picture I took in 2012, uh, on the upper right here, there's my PhD advisor, Ewan Fordyce. I won't be talking a whole lot or at all really about my PhD research, but I will acknowledge right now that Ewan Fordyce and Al Sanders are the fathers of the study of early baleen whales and early dolphins. So I owe a lot to both of these guys. Ewan is still very much alive and doing very well. And of course, in New Zealand, they have very few coronavirus cases. So he's also in a much better situation than we are. OK, a little bit of ge uh, local geology. I showed that geologic map. This is a cross section from the same map. And if we look on the lower left, there's a very simplified map. Um, there's these two major Oligocene rock units, the Ashley Formation, which is about 30 million years old, and the Chandler Bridge, which is about 5 million years younger. The Ashley Formation is limestone, so if you drop a chunk of it in vinegar, all of the rock will dissolve away. The Chandler Bridge Formation is entirely mud um, and insoluble, so it doesn't have any, uh, any shells in it. They've all been dissolved away. The Ashley Formation, on the other hand, is chock full of shells. Both indicate deposition on a continental shelf within about 20 to 50 meters uh, deep. So maybe, uh, I don't know, 10 miles off the, the shore today. That sort of environment. This is a cross section up here. The Ashley Formation is kind of this uh, brown unit. Um, we have a older Eocene unit down here called the Parker's Ferry Formation. Um, and then the Chandler Bridge Formation you'll see in the cross section is just this thin little stripe right above the Ashley. In most places it is eroded away. And if you look in this map, all the little black spots, um, ignoring of course the black dolphin outline, that's not a, that's not part of the map. Uh, but th just those little patches, those are the exposures of the Chandler Bridge. The Chandler Bridge is ex extraordinarily fossiliferous, but very hard to find deposits of. And then once you get out closer to the coast, you'll find younger units like the Goose Creek limestone, which is Pliocene, so about three to five million years old, and the Mark's Head Formation, which is about 18 million years old. And those are generally not exposed at the Earth's surface. So you have to actually drill down with an auger in order to see it at all. You can find fossils from those units that have been dredged from the bottom of the harbor or offshore at Folly Beach and the margins of the harbor. And then in different places, there's this big, what we call an unconformity or an erosional, uh, an erosional surface. Um, and there's an erosional surface that covers all of the pre-Ice Age uh, rocks. So during the Ice Age, you had um, glacial periods, about at least 20 of them, um, where sea level would fall precipitously as ice sheets grew. And then as the ice sheets melted during interglacial periods, sea level would rise again. Um, and the sea level rise and fall eroded quite a bit of older rocks, forming this um, 
extensive bone bed that overlies most of the pre-Ice Age rocks here in Charleston. Wherever you find this bone bed, you'll probably find megalodon teeth. And it's led to a local amateur paleontologist calling it the meg layer. It can be hard to find, and it's not always fossiliferous. The meg layer, where it uh, is overlain immediately by the late Pleistocene Wando formation, which is about 90 to 120,000 years old, that is the richest phosphate deposit and where most of the phosphate in Charleston was quarried in the late 19th century. And as you get further and further inland, the age of this bone bed gets older and older, which is confusing. And so you more or less just forget about that because I still don't understand it very well. Charleston stratigraphy is extremely complicated. And then most importantly, the Chandler Bridge Formation is the unit where most of our local fossils that I'll be talking about come from. But some also come from the Ashley Formation. The Chandler Bridge is rich in shark teeth. And here is a beautiful example of a megatooth shark. This is the ancestor of Megalodon called Carcaricles angustidens. Now, how do you find fossils in Charleston? I am spoiled by the fact that I, well, I'm spoiled here and I'm spoiled on the West Coast for different reasons. On the West Coast, fossils are rare. And you generally have to go do a fair bit of climbing on slippery coastal bluffs. The Pacific Coast is really unforgiving. Um, and I kind of enjoy not having to uh, risk my life for fossils um, here on the East Coast. I have been stranded on a Bayer Island once out at uh, Eddingsville, um, crossing over from Edisto. But yeah, I just got bug bitten a lot and had to, had to hitchhike. Um, on the West Coast, you could die by not planning a, a, a trip along the cliffs well enough. And if you don't, um, pay attention to the tides. I don't miss that. But what I do miss about cliffs is that you see all the rock layers. So when you find a, a scientifically important dolphin skull, you know exactly how many meters above the base of that formation it is, and therefore exactly how old it is. In Charleston, most of the fossils are ex situ. They have been removed from their geological context, or you are extremely lucky to find very small exposures. So this is Sawmill Branch Canal. It is unfortunately one of the best and most continuous exposures of Oligocene rock in the state. And it's exposed in the bottom of a canal. Now, you can, you can collect fossils from here, but you must have permission to excavate from the limestone. So there are loose shark teeth. If you want to go and walk the creek, uh, provided it hasn't rained recently and you can find them, um, there's nothing stopping you. We had permission to excavate fossils from the limestone. Um, and so what you do, you either look through the water or you bring a Pyrex dish like this and take a peek. Uh, and you look for something like that. And it doesn't look a, like much, um, but to my eye, I see part of a dolphin skull. So it looks a little bit different from the algae covered limestone. It's really soft limestone and it's also cohesive. So you can kind of just hack a, a trench around the fossil um, and then undercut it and then pull out a block um, after a couple hours. And you don't need to wrap it in a plaster jacket, which is what we normally do with fossils. But fortunately at this one spot, you can't do plaster underwater. So we're really fortunate that the Ashley limestone stays kind of blocky. So um, uh, the two gentlemen on the right are local fossil collectors, uh, Sean and Mark, um, who have both donated many scientifically significant fossils to us. In the green shirt is Jordy Taylor. <clears throat> she graduated from CFC a few years ago as a master's student in marine bio. She discovered this little dolphin skull. Um, this is uh, 4th of July in 
2017. And then the gal with the uh, Mastodon shirt, whose back is to us, that's my wife, Sarah. Sarah's our collections manager at the Mace Brown Museum. After a couple hours of hacking, we got this little dolphin skull out, and we christened it Jordy's Dolphin. It's a spear-toothed dolphin, which I'm not going to talk about a whole lot, but I do have a picture of one later, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and this photo sort of encapsulates the joy of discovering something important. So this is Jordy's first cetacean specimen that she had found. Um, it's not the best dolphin skull we have, but it is really interesting, and it's got some uh, interesting fused teeth that are very strange um, and might tell us something about the evolution of teeth in dolphins. Construction sites are another way to find good fossils in Charleston, um, if you can get onto them. This is a construction site that I uh, did extensive work on from May to October of 2018. Um, it's in Ladson, uh, South Carolina, and I actually showed a, a picture of this a minute ago um, that was cropped, so this dark layer that we see um, kind of left center, that's the Chandler Bridge formation. The rock layer that's kind of gray and below it, the closest to the water, that is the Ashley Limestone. And then this gentleman here with the white tub, that is Ashby Gale, who's the owner of Charleston Fossil Adventures. Um, Ashby has been a, a big ally of the museum. Um, he and his clients find and donate a large number of fossils from the local waterways here to our museum. And Ashby has also been a great field assistant at times. Um, so we were out here uh, about to collect a fossil dolphin, which I'll show you again uh, in a little bit. About three or four feet above Ashby's head is the Pleistocene 10 mile hill formation and the quote unquote megalodon layer. And then covered up, uh, well, formally covered up by the tarps that rained the night before. But if you see the sheet of the plank of wood there, that little bump next to it that's about two feet wide, that is a block containing a fossil dolphin a skull and mandible. At this site, we collected a large number of shark teeth. Um, we had to salvage some things quickly because sometimes uh, a single storm would raise the water layer, or the water level by a foot overnight. So there was a bit of salvage here. Um, here's uh, our collections manager, Sarah, getting extremely muddy. Um, and successfully finding some really good uh, mega teeth. And in the lower right there, that is an ancient dolphin tooth. That is from that giant dolphin genus Y. I'll be talking more about genus Y here in a little bit. And then we found a large number of teeth of Carcharicles angustidens, this early mega tooth shark, that were very small. And I'll, uh, that might be on the next slide actually. Yeah, here we are. So, Carcharicles angustidens, the teeth of this shark get up to about four, five inches long or so. Most of these teeth, however, are less than half that size. So look at the scale bar here in the middle, that's five centimeters. All of these teeth were found at this site, and about one third of these were found in one day. Um, my wife was out of the country, so she was very bummed that she wasn't there for that uh, fossil bonanza. Um, but I was pretty happy that I found all of them. The cool thing here is that when we find spectacular fossils, it means our students at CFC get really great samples to study. So one of the things uh, you'll hear um, again and again later on in this talk is student research. This is Addie Miller, uh, one of my students, um, who was fortunately for her, and very unfortunately for myself in the museum, graduating uh, this weekend from College of Charleston, she's a geology major. She did a research project. The paper uh, is wonderful. Um, we're going to be preparing it for submission to peer review later on this summer. And basically, if you look at the size distribution of all these sharks, 
almost all of them are juveniles or uh, very, very young individuals. So we hypothesize that this was a nursery area for megatooth sharks during the Oligocene. And there have been nursery areas in, uh, reported for the giant shark Megalodon, the um, descendant of Ang uh, Carcteropes angustidens from the Miocene of Panama. So this is a pretty um, fascinating uh, discovery. So keep your eyes peeled for that. We're hoping that'll make the news, hopefully the front page of the post and career. Megatooth shark nursery right here in Charleston. Another project that came out of this same fossil site uh, was just the discovery of this tiny little billfish rostrum. So billfish are swordfish. This is an extinct relative of the modern swordfish called Zip, uh, it's called Ziphiorhynchus. Ziphiorhynchus was an enormous billfish that got up to about 16 to 18 feet long. This one obviously didn't. This one may have been a baby. Um, but this uh, was written up by two of my students, Nathan McEwen, first author, and second author, Aika Ishimori. This started off as a, a project in a class of mine, and I am proud to say that this manuscript was submitted uh, to a journal for peer review about an hour and 10 minutes ago. So more stuff to keep your eyes peeled about. At this site later on in the summer, um, uh, Sarah and I found a pretty neat fossil. So um, Sarah's on the left there taking a picture of the pretty sunset. And there's a big hole next to her, which we dug out and found a bird skeleton. Bird fossils are extremely rare. Um, their skeletons are like, made almost like of cardboard. They shatter extremely easily. Uh, so when they are exposed, all you see are little splinters. Um, there's not much bone to actually see that sticking out. So if you do find a, a bird bone, consider yourself lucky. If you find a skeleton, that's major bragging rights in paleontology. So this is from either a gannet or a booby. We're not really too sure, it's the oldest it's the oldest gannet or booby skeleton from North America, we think. I'm pretty sure. There are older ones from Europe that are about five to 10 million years older. This has a skull and a nearly complete wing. So there's the wing there. So the shoulder end is on the left, and then the hand end of the wing is on the right. So we're looking at the humerus is the big element. And then the two uh, skinny elements just to the right, that's the radius and ulna. Um, so if you think about it in terms of chicken wings, we got the drumette and then the, I don't really know what part it's called, um, but the, uh, you know, the part of the chicken wing that's got two bones, that's the radius and ulna right there. And then of course, there's a modern blue-footed booby for comparison. We have no idea what this bird would look like. A little bit smaller than a blue-footed booby with about a one meter wingspan. A little, a little one. Probably was adorable in life. There are some birds that were less adorable. This is Pelagornis sanders eye, um, collected, ironically, of all places, at the airport and discovered by Al Sanders. Um, that is its skull on the left. Uh, and no, that is the actual image. It has pseudo teeth, which are projections of bone that stick out of each jaw that would have been covered in uh, beak, keratin, in life. So um, they're called the false, to uh, uh, false tooth birds or the bony tooth birds, pelagornithids. And this happens to be the largest flying bird of all time. If we look, there's the skeleton. That is a one meter scale bar. The humerus is one meter long, which is horrifying. For, for comparison, the, the humerus of the booby I just showed is only about six inches long. And then the gray outline at the upper right is a royal albatross. 
We don't really know what these birds ate. They probably were not capable of much flapping flight, so they probably spent most of their time soaring, and by virtue of not being able to flap very well, probably would have died if they landed in the water. So we think they were probably like frigate birds, snatching prey from other birds, or snatching prey, um, snatching fish, anyway, right out of the water while flying. Obviously, frigate birds are nowhere near this gigantic, though. And these birds only went extinct about 2 million years ago. We have lots and lots of sea turtles. Um, they're actually, I would say, the most common uh, vertebrate fossils next to sharks. Um, and maybe next to swordfish uh, in, in Charleston. This is Carolina Keeley's Wilson Eye. Actually, everything on the screen is Carolina Keeley's. Um, Carolina Achilles was discovered in the same hole in the ground as Xenorophis slonii up in Ladson. And it's the most common sea turtle. We have about a half dozen sea turtles um, from the Oligocene here. Half are hard-shelled sea turtles like Carolina Achilles, and the other half are leatherback sea turtles. Leatherback sea turtles don't preserve very well because their shells are made up of uh, hundreds to thousands of little polygons. Their whole shell is flexible. Um, and they're not called leatherbacks because they, like, there's, there is a bit, bit of a misnomer. A lot of people incorrectly say that they don't have a bony shell. They do, it's just very thin and it is flexible and it's covered by leather, or skin, rather. Um, the modern leatherback, uh, its shell is only about a quarter inch thick. Um, but many of these extinct leatherbacks have shells that were up to two-thirds of an inch thick. And we actually have um, evidence of at least three different leatherbacks in each, uh, each of the two Oligocene rock units, the Ashley Formation and the Chandler Bridge. And there's differences in shell thickness, ornamentation, cross-section, and density. Um, which suggests that maybe they were doing different things in terms of diving. Others had more rigid shells with many of the ossicles or the polygons here fused together. So maybe they weren't diving quite as deep. On the upper left is the most recently collected specimen, which has this interesting radial ornamentation. That was found by uh, our collections manager, Sarah, um, right before or right after Hurricane Dorian. Another one of my students, Bailey Fallon, sadly for me, also graduating next weekend, uh, has just submitted a paper on all of the leatherback sea turtles um, that we've been finding here in the Charleston area. And so it's her research that determined that we had um, four or five species total uh, from both of these units combined and three different leatherbacks in each rock unit. There is a little bit of subtle evolution going on um, during the Oligocene. I'll, I'll talk more about leatherbacks here in a bit. Um, we hope this will get published later on this summer. And then last summer, she had a paper published on a fossil leatherback from California. I will miss Bailey sorely. All right, moving forward into marine mammals. Um, I'm not going to talk about sea cows a whole lot, but we have a bunch of them. Um, these are four different types of sea cows just from the Ashley Formation. Metaxotherium albifontanum, which is also known from Florida. That's our probably our smallest sea cow. It would be about maybe, maybe six feet long. Prisca siren atlantica is known from both Charleston and also Puerto Rico. Uh, discovered by my buddy Jorge Velez Carbe, uh, curator at the LA County Museum in California. Cranatus siren Olson eye, which is also known from Florida and also from North Carolina. <clears throat> Cranatus siren is the most common one, and it's got medium sized tusks that were used to uproot um, the roots of sea grasses. And then Diopletherium manigo eye, which was 
much larger than any modern sea cow. Priscus iron was a bit large as well. But Diopotherium had about a, a foot and a half, almost two foot long skull. And it's just got these enormous blade-like tusks. So what we're looking at on, this, on the lower right is just this fragment of the snout that's got this tusk in it. And we think these big, big blade-like tusks were used for excavating even deeper and larger seagrass roots. All of these tusked dugongids, more closely related to the modern Indo-Pacific dugong, all went extinct um, about two to three million years ago. Uh, and then our local sea cow fauna was then invaded by uh, modern manatees. The rest of this talk is mostly going to be about the cetaceans, whales and dolphins. Um, modern baleen whales don't have any teeth. And they have baleen instead, which is a soft tissue structure that doesn't fossilize. They had to evolve from something. <clears throat> and one of the wackiest things I get to work on are baleen whales that still had teeth. This is Coronadon havensteini, which was collected from the bottom of the Wanda River. It's from the Ashley Formation. And this is the type specimen. So the specimen that the entire genus and species is based on um, is on display in our museum. This is the skull here. It's just phenomenally beautiful. But it's got some weird teeth. The teeth stick out of their sockets quite a bit. And they also overlap, and they're highly denticular. They have all these little cusps that stick off. Um, here's an illustration I did uh, a few years ago showing that if the animal's mouth is slightly open, you get these little diamond-shaped gaps between the teeth that might have allowed it to filter feed using only teeth and not with any baleen yet. And if we look, uh, there's a diagram showing the jaws in uh, while closed. And there's these little interdental slots that water could escape through, but prey, maybe not necessarily krill, but maybe, you know, schooling fish would not be able to escape from. On the upper right, you can see these teeth overlapping. Um, these teeth lack big chewing facets that are adapted for meat slicing. So this animal was not chewing with its back teeth, which is really unusual, even for a primitive whale. There is a modern marine mammal that feeds in a similar way. And we have used this as our modern analog. And that is the crab ear seal, which has very denticulate teeth. They don't overlap, so there's a bit of a difference in how they worked. But the, you know, the, the idea is the same. These highly denticulate teeth allow for these little gaps for water to pass through, but not prey. Modern leopard seals, which are very closely related to crab ear seals, um, are pretty famous for pictures and video of uh, killing penguins and ripping penguin heads off. They only do that a few months out of the year when all the penguins are close to shore in Antarctica for the breeding season. The rest of the year, leopard seals eat krill. Most of the time we've found leopard seals and looked through what was in their stomach. Um, I've, dead leopard seals. Uh, when the stomachs are dissected, there's like tens of thousands of krill in there and nothing else. So we think they spend about nine months out of the year filter feeding for krill and then murdering defenseless penguins the rest of the year. So we think Coronadon was able to feed on large prey and very, very small prey. And so it was sort of a, um, while we think of filter feeding as very specialist, it's actually being able to do both is very generalist. So it could do a wide variety of feeding behaviors. Here's another skull of Coronadon. Um, we have about three or four Coronadon specimens, and there's three or four more over at Charleston Museum. Um, Shelly hasn't been doing any research, but she is our student uh, preparator. So she has been responsible for cleaning a lot of fossils. Um, and right now she's cleaning off uh, two fossil dolphins on her living room table so I can continue to pay her through the pandemic and quarantine. 
So she has probably the most awesome work from home opportunity of any of uh, any CFC student. There's a lot of dolphins from Charleston. Every single one of these is from Charleston. Uh, and they're all from one family, the Xenorophidae. I'm only going to talk about a couple of these. You've, I already mentioned Xenorophis slonii. This one Xenorophis new species, I actually have to update that on this slide. That is an adult specimen of Xenorophis slonii. And we'll talk briefly about Echovenator cotylocara intermerostrum and Xenorophis. These are the most primitive known uh, echolocating dolphins. And we know they were able to echolocate because we have CT scanned their ear bones and also uh, reconstructed where various muscles and sinuses that are used in echolocation were present on the top of the skull. So here's Cotylocara, the type specimen of Cotylocara, the one that the genus and species is based on, is also on display at our museum. And there's only one known specimen. Echovenator, the type specimen is from North Charleston, but it is owned by uh, Georgia Southern, but we happen to have it on loan for the, um, at present and will through the duration of the pandemic. Unfortunately for Georgia Southern, but fortunately for me, because it's a great specimen. <clears throat> there are a large number of new skulls of Xenorophis slonii. Not all of these are slonii, but they are all uh, Xenorophis. Um, there's not much to say about Xenorophis uh, other than it's one of the larger dolphins. Um, Mostly, it's very, very well known now, and uh, I'll be publishing some research on these skulls, hopefully later this year or next year. Here's what we think a xenorophid dolphin would have looked like. Um, this is a particularly well-preserved specimen of xenorophis. We don't have a whole lot of the postcranial skeleton. We do have... Um, Good skulls, though. We don't really know what their flippers look like, which is a problem. My favorite xenorophid dolphin is Inermorostrum. Inermorostrum means weaponless snout, and it refers to the fact that this tiny little weirdo didn't have any teeth. If we look at, um, it, it's kind of weird, but this is basically a blowhole, the top of the skull, and the snout. The snout is the pointy part sticking up in A and C. Uh, and on part C of this figure where you see MX, that means maxilla, there should be about 10 tooth sockets there, let alone teeth, but it's got neither. This is a toothless dolphin. We know it's a uh, xenorophid because of several weird features of the skull that are only present in that group, but it's also tiny. The whole skull is only about 12 centimeters wide. I reconstructed the length of this animal, and it would have only been 1.2 meters long as an adult. So about 3 feet and 11 inches, which means it also happens to be the tiniest cetacean ever to evolve. There are only two specimens of it. The other, only other one is this uh, skull fragment from Charleston Museum dug up up here in Somerville. We think Intermerastrum would have looked a bit like this. It's also got an enlarged foramen, uh, which is a hole in the skull for the nerves and blood vessels that innervate whiskers in dogs and other mammals that you nor normally think of as having whiskers. Well, it turns out this might blow some people's minds. All modern whales and dolphins have whiskers. They're just really, really tiny. So we think that, um, uh, Inermorostrum may have had more of a five o'clock shadow than modern whales and dolphins do. What can you do if you don't have any teeth? Well, you can be a very effective suction feeder. So narwhals are famous for having one tooth, the big long tusk, and in fact their genus name is Monodon, but they don't have any other teeth. Sperm whales have lost all of their upper teeth, um, but they have lower teeth used for fighting. Think about that. In the tusk in the narwhal is used for social purposes. They're used for social purposes in sperm whales. And the only other group that has lost most of its teeth are the beaked whales. And the only teeth 
most beak whales have are tusks, also used in fighting. It's possible an ermorostrum had a few teeth in its lower jaw, or maybe in the very tip of the snout, which was broken off. But either way, it has the same suite of adaptations uh, for suction feeding. So it, its size also means it couldn't dive very deep at the same time. So we think it was probably a shallow water um, suction feeder, feeding on maybe sea cucumbers, squid, octopus, etc. Another one of my research students, Suzanne Grantham, um, who's also unfortunately graduating next weekend, uh, did a bit of work on a surprisingly advanced dolphin. Um, this dolphin is more similar to what you would find in the Miocene of Maryland and is quite rare here in Charleston. Here's the lower jaw pieced together um, painstakingly. Uh, Suzanne is a master um, puzzle piecer, as we call as we call it in the museum. Puzzle projects are fossils where a local collector who didn't know how to make a plaster jacket um, maybe just scooped all the bits into a bucket and then ran all those fragments and the mud containing them through a screen and then dried all the pieces and then you can glue them back together. Um, sometimes the, the skulls are all mixed up anyway, so sometimes doing that is the only way to actually get the skull to be per, uh, reconstructed in three dimensions. Um, it's not my favorite way of collecting fossils, but I do understand why it's done sometimes. Okay, so a bit of a teaser here. Um, this giant skull, it's not that giant, it's a very, very large dolphin, though it's nothing like the size of a sperm whale. Um, this is genus Y, and this animal uh, was put in the wrong genus many, many years ago. Um, this genus called Squalodon, which means shark tooth, and shark tooth dolphins um, are a group of archaic dolphins from the Miocene, and there are a few oligocene species that are similar, but do not belong in this genus. So a paper I am working on at the moment, um, hopefully I'll actually be putting my finishing touches on the manuscript revisions this evening after I'm done with this. Uh, we will be giving it a new name and interpreting a lot about its feeding ecology and the implications for the locomotion and swimming habits of these dolphins. Genus Y is known from about a half dozen good skulls and skeletons from Charleston. This individual specimen, however, has quite a bit of the skeleton preserved. This is CCNHM 103, collected from, I think, Crowfield Plantation in Goose Creek. Got this big, beautiful skull, but also the most complete vertebral column um, and flipper for any early dolphin. I can't say a whole lot about the uh, locomotion at this point, aside from the fact that what this dolphin tells us means that many, many features, that would be kind of difficult to explain, many features that we think of as being characteristic of modern whales and modern dolphins must have evolved twice, independently in echolocating dolphins and a second time in baleen whales. This thing is also an apex predator. It's got big teeth. It's got big uh, bulges of bone around the roots of the teeth to anchor them in properly. Um, this was probably a pretty scary looking animal in life. And it's also got tusks. You can see on the, the last slide, it's got these tusks that stick straight out, and they're also heavily broken and worn down. So we actually think that this animal would swim pretty fast and then just ram prey to death with these tusks that stick out uh, forward. And its tusks in its lower jaw are even, um, they're basically parallel with the jaw. And I've reconstructed them improperly in this diagram here. But 
be on the lookout for news about a large predatory dolphin from Charleston. I'm pretty excited about this. And I've been working nonstop. Actually, no. Pretty stoppy here and there over the past four years. But uh, this has been the biggest project I've been working on since um, Charleston on our biggest dolphin. Other dolphins that are um, uh, a little stranger include Wacky. Wacky the Wipatiid. So Wipatia metafenua is a uh, close relative named by my PhD advisor, Ewan Fordyce, from New Zealand. Same age, same family of dolphins. Um, we didn't know much about the teeth in the front of the jaws of Wipatia because that part was eroded out of the cliff when my PhD advisor found it in 1990. All right, 1990. Um, but this skull here and skeleton uh, was a bit more completely preserved and shows that these tusks in the chin just jutted out forward. We have no idea what these are for. These are a little more skinny and gracile than in genus Y. So I'm not sure that the prey ramming hypothesis works. Um, Nevertheless, this is going to be one of my big projects this summer, uh, so I got to think about it a little more clear, um, clearly. Another fossil is this thing, also with tusks. This is Eosqualodon, and this is much closer to um, the better known Squalodon from Calvert Cliffs up in Maryland. It's about two thirds the size of genus Y, and is most similar to Eosqualodon langovicii from the Oligocene of Austria. I haven't done anything with this dolphin yet, but here it is getting uh, ready for laser scanning by my buddy Morgan. Okay, so I've talked a lot about the Oligocene. I haven't really talked about the Eocene or the Miocene much, but I'm gonna summarize what we've learned uh, in very, very broad strokes from the fossil record of Charleston. I mentioned the Eocene is the period of time where whales evolved from uh, terrestrial mammal ancestors. They are most closely related to things like goats and hippos. And in fact, the earliest aquatic whales were kind of deer-like and still herbivorous and had little adorable hooves, but were maybe about the size of a border collie. And that's about 55 to 60 million years ago, that ancestral herbivorous whale called Indohyus. Within a, about 10 million years, we had semi-aquatic otter-like whales. Um, and by the end of the Eocene, we had fully aquatic uh, whales that looked a bit like these guys on the left, which still had vestigial hind legs, but had modern caudal flukes um, and a, a shearing dentition, kind of like a giant dog. During the Eocene in South Carolina, we have at least three different basilosaurids. These are um, the last group of ancient whales that gave rise to modern whales, i.e. Uh, echolocating dolphins and baleen whales. And we had at least three species of basilosaurids. Basilosaurus, if you, if you noted, saurus is in there, just like Tyrannosaurus. They were initially discovered in Louisiana and misinterpreted as giant marine reptiles. Because of the way taxonomy works, we're stuck with the first name. Otherwise, you just rename anything you wanted, um, and it would be uh, scholarly chaos. So during the Oligocene, we had a large number of leatherback sea turtles, just a few species of whales that were all very, very similar. Um, the ancestor of Megalodon at the time was just slightly larger than a modern great white shark, and we had a couple of billfish. Something happens though across the Oligocene Eocene boundary, and there is an explosion in whale diversity. We have two to three baleen whales that have baleen. We have a couple of baleen whales that have teeth and no baleen. Um, and then we got about like 15 to 20 dolphins. Genus Y is this big bruiser. Um, we got a Nermorastrin, a little tiny dwarf toothless suction feeding dolphin and a host of others that are 
spear tooth dolphins and and similar ones that probably would have filled a niche similar to a modern bottlenose dolphin. We have still a lot of leatherback sea turtles, but at least at least three, which is less than the Eocene, but still a uh, way more than we have today. The ancestor of Megalodon at this stage, Carcaricles angustidens, is a little bit bigger. We also have this huge diversity of billfish, five or six species, or maybe even more than that, from the Oligocene of Charleston. Um, that's also very unusual. We don't have any species or any uh, assemblages of modern billfish anywhere today that are that diverse in one location. And then we get to the Miocene, and of course we get the big bruiser. Uh, herself, Megalodon, evolves. We only have a couple billfish, only one leatherback sea turtle left. Um, baleen whales become very rare for a while, and they don't appear in the East Coast fossil record again for about five million years into the Miocene. And we get weird new super long snouted dolphins. We get more shark toothed dolphins um, like True Squalodon several species of squalodon in places like the Caliber Cliffs in Maryland. And then after things like genus Y go extinct, we get giant killer sperm whales, um, which are pretty awesome fossils. We get these worldwide, uh, we get one in the Southern Hemisphere called Leviathan Melvilli, named after Herman Melville. Leviathan had teeth that were the size of two liter soda bottles. So we have pretty strong faunal contrasts across each of these boundaries representing uh, important faunal events. So a bit of background about that um, to wrap this up. Uh, things are happening. So we can think about climate and paleogeography and the two are very linked. This red line down here, this is basically global climate from the uh, Cretaceous Paleogene extinction that killed off all the dinosaurs starting at 65 million years ago. That's on the left. And then today is zero million years ago, obviously. Through time, it's generally gotten colder. But there are a few big spikes that have happened. Um, we have the PETM, the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, which is a very short term spike in global temperature caused by widespread release of methane from the seafloor, which is something that. Um, uh, keeps climatologists awake at night, thinking about what that would happen or what that would cause today. Think about all the methane being released from Siberian permafrost. Multiply that by 100, and that's sort of the scale of what would happen um, if these deep sea methane deposits um, uh, were exposed. It warms up during the Eocene and then gradually cools. And then there's a big cooling event 34 million years ago. And you'll see above this blue star here, this precipitous drop in global climate. That is caused by the setup of the Circumantarctic current. Antarctica during the Eocene is still sort of connected to Australia and South America, or connected enough um, that there's not a current that goes around Antarctica like it does today. Essentially what it does, once these three continents are separated enough um, at about 34 million years ago, it sets up the circum Arctic, or cir circum Antarctic current or the circumpolar current, and it basically, basically thermally insulates Antarctica from the rest of the world. It prevents, um, uh, what was essentially a, uh, an analog of the Gulf Stream in the Southern Hemisphere from keeping Antarctica warm. So we lose land mammals in Antarctica at this time. We lose frogs. There's just a paper on the first fossil frog from Antarctica from the Eocene. Um, and we lose uh, forests in Antarctica. And we get the first ice caps um, during the early Oligocene which causes a major drop in sea level, which also causes a lot of erosion. That erosion erodes away most Oligocene deposits 
uh, worldwide. So in other places, the Oligocene is represented as an erosional um, bone bed. Actually, not even as a, rarely as a bone bed, but as an erosional surface. Here in Charleston, the Charleston embayment was being subsided and it escaped erosion. So that makes Charleston one of the only places in the world to answer some important questions about how did echolocation evolve? How did filter feeding evolve? Because other places just don't ho have those fossils. The only other places in the world to investigate the early evolution of um, early modern cetaceans is New Zealand, which is why I did my PhD there. One locality in Australia, uh, a couple places in Japan, the Pacific Northwest, Austria, and then a few places um, in Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan. And then ever since the uh, Oligocene climate crash, um, it's been cooling more ever since, with a couple of brief warming events in the Miocene. So sort of a broad level uh, summary of what, what happened. This climate crash triggers a radiation of cetaceans. We think, um, uh, well, we know there's a, a radiation of filter feeding and uh, filter feeding whales and echolocating whales. And we think this is caused by uh, the onset of worldwide upwelling. Um, Circumantarctic current also drives global upwelling. So there is a major reorganization uh, of food webs from the Eocene to the Oligocene. So whale faunas go from like two to three species to 15 to 30 species. So this is sort of the, the um, inception of modern whale diversity. We possibly get a radiation of billfish. Um, uh, many, many mackerel sharks go extinct and we have a radiation of reef sharks. Something I didn't even get to talk about, during the Eocene, we have the last giant sea snakes. We have fossil sea snakes from Harleyville that got up to about 15 feet long. All of those went extinct because it got too cold. Many of these early uh, experimental lineages of cetaceans that I've talked about in this lecture all go extinct at the end of the Miocene. And baleen whales are rare worldwide for about 5 million years. Um, during the Miocene, we have a, a decreasing diversity of billfish and leatherbacks. Uh, and of course, the largest shark ever, Megalodon, evolves during the Miocene. By the middle Miocene, we get the first members of modern cetacean families, so the earliest delphinids, oceanic dolphins, um, earliest porpoises, the earliest members of the humpback um, fin whale lineage. Um, and then we more or less get modern shark and fish faunas at this time. And then by the time we get to the Pliocene, the last 5 million years or so, we get the earliest records of modern genera and the first records of modern species in the Pleistocene, which is another time period I'm interested in, um, but really can't, don't have any time to talk about in this lecture. I hope um, you'll go ahead and uh, take a look at our social media. So we are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I also included my uh, Twitter handle there too. Um, we post extensively about our research, our student activity, our volunteer activity, and uh, lots of information about local natural history with a paleontological focus. And while you're social distancing, outdoors. Keep your eyes peeled this summer for anywhere where you see these little black rocks. Those are phosphate nodules. If you see phosphate nodules, you'll probably find shark teeth. And if you get hooked, keep an eye out for these little things. These are dolphin ear bones. They're not spectacular. They're not terribly photogenic. Um, but they tell us a lot about diversity through time. Uh, and I'm kind of unhealthily obsessed with them. So if you find them, hold on to them and donate them to the museum for our student researchers. Thanks a million to the Sierra Club.
to our collections manager, Sarah Bosnecker, Jesse Perigini, and Matt Gibson over at Charleston Museum. And thanks to my uh, co-authors co for various projects talked about in here, Jonathan Geisler, Brian Beatty, Morgan Churchill, Emily Buckholtz, Rachel Rassicott, all of my wonderful students who I'll miss very, very much. Um, and I'm trying very hard not to think about that or the fact that I haven't been able to see them in person since March. Um, and wash your hands. Uh, and with that, um, thanks so much for listening. And uh, I think there's a Q&A session. So yeah. thanks, y'all. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, I think.